Welcome everyone to the September Michigan Unix Users Group meeting. Uh, my name is Craig Maloney and I will be your host for this evening. Uh, please, if you will, make sure that you're muted as well as your, your devices and the other stuff like that. Invariably during this, someone will get a call or something like that and we will all get to hear your dulcet tones of your reading tone. Uh, unless you'd like to share with the rest of the, the group. Um, I know some of us don't have uh, ringtones that we like to share with the rest of the group. So mute yourselves as much as you can, please. I'd like to introduce our board members. Uh, we'll start off with Lazaro Carl's Carol, James Heiss, Craig Maloney, which is myself, Jim McQuillan, Dave Satwitz, and Justin Triplett. Uh, we also have Sharon Kawani, who's our board member emeritus, uh, Jim Gluting, who's also a board member emeritus, and Richard Williams, who's our treasurer and handles all of our membership stuff. I'd like to welcome anyone who's here for the first time. Is there anyone who's here who's a first timer? Go ahead and raise your hand. And if you want to say something about yourself, please do. Go ahead. Uh, hello, Charlie. Pleasure to meet you. I have been, um, I, I, I was um, active with the Metro Detroit Linux Users Group. And uh, I think I might see one or two of those guys out here. And uh, it's a great time. I don't work in the field, I don't uh, use the internet that much. Um, but you know, the, the, uh, you know, Debian Commonwealth has been, uh, it's great. It's just great. I'm a desktop user. I don't, uh, mess with mobile development, any of that, like big stuff that all the groups do. Um, uh, you know, I'm like 40 years in the past in software, but everything's wonderful. It's perfect. Great. Excellent. Anybody else who's here for the first time? By the way, welcome. Welcome, Charlie. Uh, all right. Well, let's move on then. Membership. Uh, Dave, would you like to talk a little bit about membership or do you want me to try and riff on this for a bit? Well, I'll, um, I'll talk about it. Uh, uh, we, we have, I have a sort of a standard uh, uh, plea for membership, not plea, uh, um, invitation to, to membership that uh, we put on uh, every month. Uh, in general, bef before the lockdown, uh, we had as a group some expenses, primarily that uh, a few others, but primarily that was renting the room that we were meeting in. Now that we aren't meeting in a room, we don't have those expenses. And so our need for membership dues has really been diminished. And uh, the library has given us back all the money that we had prepaid them for the room that we were renting. And we, we, would have had enough to rent for another year, um, to pay up for another year. Um, you know, so uh, we have a few expenses. That they're, they're nowhere near what our membership fees would be because the um, uh, most of it, almost all of it, went to renting the room. Uh, we really don't want, don't want to lose our membership, but, you know, and, and uh, sooner or later this will end and, and we'll be back to something that, hopefully that was normal before uh so uh you know if uh if you're able and willing and uh you know you can continue uh uh with memberships and renewing and and, and buying a new membership it's 50 dollars a year uh, right now we we don't actually have a cash need right now and so uh you know if you just rather certainly if you if, if it's at all an issue to you, if the 50 bucks is, uh, is, is an issue at, at all, just uh, hang on to it for a while. And, uh, you know, when, when we need more money, we'll start asking for it again. Awesome. Thank you. Just to reiterate, too, um, we are like we are still doing renewals of memberships and all that other kind of stuff. So if you still want to support us, that's awesome. But if you yourself have a need, uh, or if someone else you know has a need or something like that, uh, please please feel the, fill the needs as much as you are able to. Um, I know everyone's having a lot of fun with this whole pandemic stuff, so that's enough said on that. Uh, speaking of which, are there any jobs that are looking for people? I know Gib just posted one uh, on our mailing list, uh, on several of the mailing lists, so go ahead, Gib. Yes, thank you. So go out to Ford.com, slide way down the bottom, click on careers. There'll be a little, little thing you can put in uh, what 
uh, area and what type of job you want. So if you select uh, North America or US, United States, and then you put in experienced professional, then you put information technology, it'll bring up a very short list. We got a very short list because uh, Ford is like letting people go. This past month, they announced they're going to let go, I think, 1,200 um, salary people. So um, in the list, there is one job that uh, stands out because it's the group I belong to. So it's for AI and native language processing uh, skills. So if you know a little bit about like machine learning and native language processing and understanding speech recognition, so text to speech, those types of things, uh, we're looking for you. So uh, you know, take a look at uh, that posting and uh, see if it uh, if you qualify and if you're interested. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Any other jobs that are looking for people? Well, let's turn it around then. Uh, are there any people looking for jobs? And be advised, we are streaming right now. So if anyone happens to be watching um, or doesn't want to be sharing online, we do have our discuss mailing list again. If you wanted to uh, send out that. But is there any, uh, are any people looking for jobs? Once, twice. Okay, let's move on then. Um, I mentioned the comment cards, and if you haven't seen this already, there's a link to our comment card, um, which is available in the chat. Uh, hopefully it's still available in chat. If not, I'm going to resubmit that so that you may take a look at it. And of course, as soon as my computer behaves properly, Behaving well computers, always a good thing. Uh, one thing that we have on here is the um, a section where you can tell us how relevant the topic was for you, uh, the presentation and the delivery, whether you learned something new or not, and you can rate those on a scale from one to five. We are, we are not about the binary here. We also have a section on there for um, <laughs> on our physical one about upcoming meetings. That's not on this particular card, but I will talk about our upcoming meetings. We have a section for the comments themselves. If you want to put uh, do a long form comment, if you want to spill your heart and let us know how wonderful we are or any other things like that, please feel free to do so. And if you have any ideas for future topics, you can uh, post those as well. We also have a section in there for your name. And if you would like to be a part of our announced mailing list, please feel free to add your email address in there. And there's a checkbox that'll allow you to be subscribed to the mailing list. And the announced mailing list will allow you to get updates on future meetings and other assorted pertinent topics. Um, like say, for instance, if we ever meet in person or if we decide to go out for, and have some pizza somewhere, um, who can say? But that'll allow you to keep up to date on any goings on with the group. I'd like to thank our sponsors. I'd like to thank Averis, Penguicon, Altair, and A2 Hosting. Uh, they're helping us put this meeting on. We'd also like to thank our media partners, No Starch Press, Inform IT slash Pearson, and Manning. If you head on over to our website, you can find links and coupon codes for each one of these uh, organizations. Some of them work better than others. Um, very good discounts, especially uh, with our friends over at No Starch, uh, Pearson, and Manning. So check them out and tell them we sent you. Uh, hopefully the coupon code will do that as much, but sometimes there's even comment cards or something like that. Just let them know that you appreciate them supporting our group. We'd like you also to stay connected with us via, via with us via other means. He said that tongue toastingly. Uh, one of those ways you can do so is to visit our website over at mug.org where you can find all the information about upcoming meetings, past meetings, videos for past meetings and such, uh, membership stuff, videos, a store, if you'd like to wear or otherwise acquire mug merchandise, spon uh, our sponsors and also other groups. You'll also notice on the meetings dropdown, if you head on over to our tro topics Trello board, You'll find all the topics that we are working on, uh, things such as where to suggest new topics. If you don't feel like posting a comment card, you can do that here. You can vote on suggested topics. So anything that surfaces up to the top, we'll know there's more of a demand for it. And so we'll try and get uh, someone to talk about it. We also have 
speakers with topics. These are folks that have suggested topics to us and said, hey, I would love to present on such and such. You can vote on those and let us know which ones are more interesting to you. We also have uh, all the topics that have a whole bunch of votes, uh, a whole bunch being two or more. Those will go on over into this column and the ones that hit to the top, we'll try and get do more. We'll try and do our best. I mean, we always try and do our best to try and find people to do these topics, but we also will put an extra effort into that. And you can also find our schedule column, which has all the uh, topics that are have been scheduled and all the stuff that we're working on. We do have for our October meeting, we have Scott Belneves, who will be talking about open VPN. That'll be in our October meeting. We'll talk a little bit more about that toward the end of the meeting. You can also connect with us via other means. I mentioned our announced mailing list, but there's also the discuss mailing list, which is more of a general topics list. If there's anything that you would like to talk about regarding Unix, Linux, open source software, free software, any of those type of topics, feel free to post it on there. And you can also watch our videos on YouTube. Uh, we do try and put them up on PeerTube. Sometimes that works better than others. The last meeting, I tried to push it up onto PeerTube, but I ran into some quota issues on the system that I'm on. So I do try and post them up on PeerTube, but we don't really advertise that. Um, more to come on that. You can also join our get together and our meetup groups as well. And you can follow our social media, such as it is, over at contact-us. So that's um, hand over to the contact us and you'll see all the places that we have a social media presence. There's other groups in the area as well. Uh, one of them we are already mentioned, which is the MD Lug. Gib, do you have anything you'd like to talk about with MD Lug? Yes. So we have, you know, as usual, a group of small, a small group of people who will be getting together and talking, much like we're doing today, about you know technology, computers, open source, Linux, that you know, good stuff like that. We're going to have one of our uh, regular uh, folks come in and talk a little bit. And it's going to be just sort of like an open mic kind of thing for this one individual to come in. And, and it's Pat Baker. Um, some of you may know him. Very knowledgeable about security and all kinds of things, you know, security-based. So this is going to be a real interesting thing to have him uh, talk. When, when he goes deep, he goes deep. So uh, you want to put on your technical hat for uh, that little discussion, but there'll be plenty of time for, you know, just idle chatter and that type of thing. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Semco, is there anyone who would like to talk about Semco? Uh, yes, I can talk about Semco. Please do. Yes. Uh, we are having an individual. Uh, oh, name slipped out of my head. Anyway, he's going to be talking from Microsoft. He's going to be talking about PowerShell. PowerShell. Excellent. PowerShell is a very powerful tool. Similar to, it's just about as sophisticated as the uh, uh, shells you have in, in Linux. And also, it's available for Linux. Then after that, Shuan Kawani will come in and talk about the different shells that are available for Linux in our uh, special interest group on Linux section. So uh, PowerShell is now available for Linux. And so uh, there may be times when different companies use it because it works both on Windows and on Linux. So I think it's a good thing for everybody to learn. So consider joining our meeting online. The link to join the meeting will be available. You, Usually I put it up there about Wednesday or Thursday on our website. And your website is at? SCMCO.org. SEMCO.org. Excellent. Learn more over at SEMCO.org. Uh, there are other groups as well in the area. Uh, you can find some of them over on Get Together. That's gettogether.community. Uh, there's ones like Eastern Michigan Python Users, Users Group and Coffee House Coders and a whole bunch more. There's also ones available on Meetup, and you can also check our groups page for other groups that are in the area. Miscellany, hopefully your bathroom is in your house. Hopefully your refreshments are as well. Otherwise, you're in a world of hurt. Is there any other business that I can attend to that we need to attend to? Three, two, one. All right. 
One more, once more, uh, please mute yourselves and your phones as much as you are willing and are able to. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to myself. So we are going to talk a little bit about the future of open source. Uh, let's see, why did, why did my camera die all of a sudden? That was nice of it, wasn't it? All right. Um, so we, we were talking about topics for this meeting. And one of the things that came up was having a discussion about the future of open source software. And we've been talking about open source. I mean, the Free Software Foundation started back in 1989. And so we've been talking about free and open source software. Free software back in 1989, open source software, I think it was around 80, or sorry, 93 through 95, they were talking about uh, open source software. That was when it started becoming a, a thing. And so we've had a lot of time to really discuss what open source meant back in the late, you know, the early 90s, late 90s, 2000s, 2010s and such. But it's, it's starting to get interesting uh, because we're starting to see a lot of things as far as the landscape changing. I mean, we're no longer talking about computers on in our homes. We're no longer talking about computers in our businesses. We're talking more about computers in the cloud. We're talking about computers that are <laughs> consumer devices. We're talking about things like phones and smartphones, smart devices, Internet of Things, all that other kind of stuff. And so one thought that came to mind is, and first off, I'd like to say that this is not going to be just listen to Craig talk about open source software. God forbid. Uh, this is all more about having a discussion about this stuff. So if you are, have uh, something you would like to discuss, please feel free to raise your hand, uh, whether if you do so like this or whether if you do so with the little hand wavy thing um, to, to just get some attention and just let's have let's feel the flow of this conversation. I mean, obviously we're gonna talk over ourselves and all that kind of stuff, but at least try and feel the flow of the conversation. And what I'd like to start off with is we start talking about the processor landscape. Because one of the things that has been interesting to me is we now have stuff like Apple Silicon coming into play, where Apple is moving their entire platform over to ARM-based chips. And for me, that's slightly frightening because the way that Apple seems to be moving is, the, well, first off, on their, on their own platforms, they've moved away from having GPL software and are now having more BSD type software and, and MIT licensed software. And I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts about that particular move. We can open it up. Yeah. Harold, please, yes. Did I? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm not sure that it's a move away from because the the foundation of the OS has always been uh, what FreeBSD. Yes, I. Well, it's it's the Darwin kernel and such, which I think is FreeBSD. Right. Well, it's, yeah, the the kernel is based on Mach, which is something else entirely. But yeah, the the user yeah. space and all the other stuff is free BSD. So I'm not sure that I phrase it as a moving away from the GPL. Well, so they pulled off um, Bash from the shells, the, the default shell, and, and moved it over to ZSH, which is no longer a, a GPL uh, shell and such. Go ahead, Nick. Nick, are you there? NIK? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. No worries. Um, then moving over to the BSD, uh, licensing actually makes a lot of sense because that is what uh, most BSDs use. It also fits a lot more with the business standard that Apple has been in for quite a while is that they like to give back to the community but also hold on to what they want. And the BSD... Uh, licensing model allows them to kind of still do that. Um, as for moving over to, what is it, Z shell? Um, yes. 
I had heard that uh, the reason why they did that was uh, security reasons, that uh, it's more secure using the Z shell compared to Bash. I don't have much experience outside of Bash, so I really can't say anything on that front. Yeah, but that's what I heard. Here. Same here. Thank you. Dave, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, I, I wonder if you could say a few words uh, about, because I don't know uh, much about the actual differences in those licenses and, and what is required and permitted and not permitted in those. Oh God, a brief de <laughs> brief description about the GPL and BSD. Yeah, I know, it's because it, it, there are like 30 different GPL kinds of licenses. And- uh, Well, you're talking about 30 different kinds of open source licenses. Open source There's only been three GPL licenses plus the AGPL. Would anyone like to tackle that? Uh, please feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to tackle that. <laughs> um, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, GPL 2 and 3 are, if you are going to develop this software, you have free range of it, but you have to give any changes that you have made back to the community. Uh, there, There's no, okay, I, I took this and I made changes and I can keep that to myself. Uh, proprietary does not exist with the GPL uh, 2 and 3, especially with 3 from what I've read. Um, can I clarify that? Sure, go ahead. Uh, that, that only applies if you distribute the program to somebody else. Yeah. You can do on your own computer whatever you want and not have to give it to, not have to give out your changes. Okay. Uh, BSD is a little bit more uh, conservative, I guess you could phrase it uh, you're able to use uh, the software you're able to uh, make changes to it you are not required to release those changes back to the community um, I I saw a big argument with that uh, back in the day when it was still called uh, PC BSD because originally when they started that project they were rich they were going with GPL2 but then after they figured out uh, the licensing conflicts they went back to bsd and again with that model you don't have to release that information back to the community you can keep it uh somewhat proprietary right justin you look like you had your hand up oh uh, yeah i mean i guess i could add a few things but yeah the, the bsd versus gpl is you know copy left versus um you know open source in general bsd doesn't force that and and yeah, on the commercial sector, we see uh, the that advantage that was mentioned that if you're not distributing the software, uh, yeah, you can do whatever you want to it, of course, and uh, provide it as a service, which is um, related to another big topic in open source right now is that, well, yeah, it's really easy for a company of any reasonable size to manage and an instance of an open source service and now suddenly you're like oh okay great i'm gonna get you know i'm gonna get mysql or postgres from from this corporation <laughs> and like so you don't have to manage your instance anymore and you don't have to worry about the updating and stuff like that and you're not customizing it but they can do any of that that they want and they are going to make tons of money off of that and then not contribute back to open source so and that gets into the community licensing thing yeah as well. um, Which there has been some recent changes i'm not totally up to date on but yeah right um so for those of you who aren't familiar with community licenses uh there are licenses and i'm gonna probably botch most describing some of them but there were stuff like redis and mongodb that are trying to use a licensing model where if you are a company like Amazon, uh, you don't necessarily get the, the software gratis. You have to pay a, a commercial licensing fee to distribute that software. So before it would be something like, uh, you know, if you were AWS, you could spin up, you know, a billion Postgres instances and not have to pay any anything back to the Postgres Foundation. Whereas with MongoDB and Redis, most of their income comes from licensing that software and having it be open and available to someone like Amazon and be able to spin up, you know, those billion instances or whatnot. And I'm using billion in, in a relative term. 
um, they they want to have a cut of that of that revenue uh, that's going back to Amazon for that stuff. Dave, you look like you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, that's uh, and I'm aware of that uh, that, that problem with uh, the the uh, web based stuff and you know who do you have to uh, uh, contribute back. I, but I had a question about some uh, some embedded stuff. Like I have a, um, a Samsung TV, which is uh, I think run uh, by a Linux system in the background. Are they required to uh, supply me with software for that? And how would they do that? How how would they they be required to um, to give me whatever they had? Uh, would it just put put it up on a on a website somewhere? So the weird thing is I've seen TVs, like my parents have a Vizio TV and it has a section on there for licenses. And you can literally find like all the licenses that are uh, that that particular television uses, which is the most weird thing to see. You know, it's like, oh, it's got free type. It's got um, a couple other things on there. I don't remember offhand, but they also make it so that you generally speaking, go to a website and they will give you the software and the changes that they have done to that particular software. And depending on the manufacturer, some manufacturers are better than others. Some of them are really bad at bring, um, having their changes republished. Some of them are incredibly good at that. Um, but yeah, that is that is one thing where they will go, th you know, the, the companies will at least let you know that you have, that they have uh, GPL software in there. And, and some of them, Put it front and center, um, like when you agree to the license terms. I've more than once I've clicked on something and the license term has been agree to the GPL, and it's like, yeah, I agree to the GPL. I've agreed to the GPL for quite a long time, and some of you know some of them will bury it in an about menu somewhere underneath the credits or whatnot for that particular software. So that is that is one thing that uh, these companies have done. Gib, you have your hand up. Yes, so I think this is a very interesting topic. Um, and so, you know, some companies might send you uh, on the open source if you send them a letter, right, in paper, snail mail fashion. I don't know what format it would come. It would be interesting to experiment with that and, and request someone to send you a, a copy and see if it comes back in floppy disks or what. Um, but the interesting thing about this to me is how I use open source at work is sometimes um, regulated by the company. So if I am interested in using some open source, I am obligated by the company policy on how to use the software on the computers that I use, but that might neglect to, you know, adhere to this, the, the, you know, the concept of open source that you know, allows you to use it as you wish, which is an interesting conflict. I think the other thing too is, there's this concept that some of the open source licensing is, um, I don't know, destructive in the sense that once once you incorporate that open source, it now makes everything else open source. And so some companies are really hesitant to let you use software that has that type of license in that it's like a cancer that will de then create open source requirements and obligations throughout all the other software you have. So one of the obligations is if you redistribute the software, that now you have to provide you know, the open source copy of everything that you have. And it may be proprietary or intended to be proprietary software that you've developed and spent a lot of money and effort on. So um, you have to be really careful when you start mixing the software together and using it very way. Um, so we have a, a group of people that basically have tools that run through the software. There's tools you can get. Uh, Fossology is uh, one of the tools. And it will uh, sort of let you go through all the comments in all the source code and pull out the information on what uh, open source licenses are in that group of, of open source. So thank you. Very cool. Thank you. Um, yes, I see a hand. Yes. Um, so uh, my understanding with GPL2, you don't have to go looking for people to give it to. They, they got to come looking to you. They, they have to ask you uh, for the source code. And, and really the only, and it's not just any, it's people that you've given the source code 
too, I, I would think. I, I, and the other is, I think Gibby's saying his company enforces checking where their software is coming from. That's, that's their company's policy of verifying the licenses of everything they distribute. It's not really the people that wrote the GPL2 software that is requiring it. But well, there are true. some licenses that do require you. Like, like, what is it, the Regents of California? When you use their license, you are required to visibly post uh, that you're using their license? I th well, I, th I, yeah, first, first off, on the GPL stuff, there are people um, who go out, and in fact, I think it's the, I don't remember exactly which group it is, and I don't want to say one and, and have it not be them, but there are groups that will go out and challenge companies to produce the soft, the source code for anything that they have said is GPL. And it, it can get a little interesting and it can get a little. They, 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 they can't do that though, uh, unless they have a client that uh, is using the software, can they? I, then this gets into weird territory and I'm not sure I want to go down that rabbit hole because I think that could, that could completely destroy the conversation. But yeah, I my understanding, um, and again, we're we're both speaking from understandings and such. So who knows what the actual thing is? But my understanding was that they could do that as get, someone who's interested. Get Stolman on the phone. Yeah, well, I was gonna say or or, Black <laughs> or the Software Freedom Conservatory. Go ahead, Charlie. Changed my mind. Sorry. Oh, no worries. So. I, this this gets into the current situation with open source software, though, and, and the Free Software Foundation and and such. I'm wondering, though, what in in a future sense, what we're going to have? Because again, we, I, I shared a link to the Commons clause, and the, one of the the questions on there is, is this open source? And it says no. This is not open source. The open source has a specific definition that was written years ago and is stewarded by the open source initiative, which approves open source licenses. And then it goes on to say, we're not an open source license. So I, I'm getting the sense that there are some folks that are, are saying, okay, the, the 90s are over, Grandpa. Uh, it's time to move onward from, you know, everyone gets access to the source code to only certain folks get access to this stuff. Dave, you have your hand up. Yeah, I do. Um, when, when I talk about open source to any number of people, uh, including some who have been in the computer industry for a lot of their lives, um, I find what I detect to be a, a, a very low awareness of the penetration of open source. And, and trying to explain to people, you know, they say, well, I use Windows. I mean, that's not or I use my cell phone or I use uh, uh, an iPad. Uh, so I, I wonder if anybody has off the top of their head um, a, a brief synopsis of, of how far the penetration is. Because, you know, virtually all the websites have open source components behind running them. Uh, all the embedded devices like TVs and things like that have open source behind them. Apple has a version of open source behind behind everything it does. Even Microsoft, as we heard earlier tonight, has, uh, you know, a, in their PowerShell, a, uh, I, I think they, they've arranged uh, with Canonical on that, and have a, have a uh, Ubuntu um, uh, plug in there, or, or some sort of mechanism to run in their PowerShell. Um, it, it's, it, I, th I think that there is the, the free software, free and open software, is in, in one sense everywhere. It, it, you know, you, you're hardly ever away from it, certainly if you're using the web. I just wonder if anybody had a, a quick synopsis of just of how far that is and how much of it is out there. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, you know, I used to laugh uh, Android, Google, and the uh, Ubuntu web page. They would do anything they possibly could to not mention the word Linux. Um, and I find my experience being the Linux, Linux evangelist in the world of regular people, nobody cares. No, nobody, nobody knows what Linux is. They, they, they don't even know what Windows. And they're proud to be ignorant of it. That's my experience. So I'm, I'm a little less cynical on that. And I'm going to 
Charlie, uh, give me one second before you, and, and Justin, give me one second. <laughs> um, when we, so when, when we say, you know, how far is open source penetrated the, the, the mindset of folks, look nowhere, no further than when people start talking about, well, I went over to GitHub and picked something up. It's not even so much a, a so I, I liken it to when people actually went and consciously bought a light bulb or consciously bought a radio, and that was a really big deal. And then all of a sudden, you know, you you found radios in cereal boxes, and you could you know solder together your own radio at some point and not have to really think too much about it. And if it didn't work, oh well. So I think we're hitting that point where it's almost taken for granted in a lot of cases. And so that was one of the questions I had was how much are we taking this stuff for granted and how much are we going to have going forward in the future? Charlie, you had your hand up first. Yes, thank you very courteous here. Everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, you're good. All right, thanks. Um, uh, well, there, there's no way to mention this without kind of denigrating the whole purpose of the discussion here, and I apologize for that. Um, but I think the interest in licensing outside of like kind of we call that the hardcore fan community is because for 50 plus years, um, the law has meant nothing to any of the major actors in the computer sphere. Um, you know, my, Microsoft in particular, you know, uh, flagrantly, I started, uh, I started learning intellectual property and I couldn't continue because there was not one fundamental doctrine of IP that any, um, large software company has, has, has paid even lip service to. It, it means nothing at all to them. I don't even want to start ranting on them. If this turns into a Microsoft hate fest, that's okay. But, um, no, that, that's that's actually very interesting because so the one I've, I've been looking at some old computing stuff and again, apologies uh, for going down this rabbit hole, but I've been looking at a lot of old computer stuff. And one of the things that I was looking at was uh, Gem and Apple. And so for those of you who don't remember or were not around, uh, there was a company called Digital Research that created a interface called Gem which looked very much like Apple and borrowed a lot of cues from Apple. And Apple sued digital research and successfully sued them. And I should say successfully, I think they successfully got them to settle and change the interface enough so that it was unrecognizable and unusable, in my opinion, after the fact. And so it's it's interesting. So you, finding where instances where intellectual property and i hate that term but intellectual property stuff has been successful is would be interesting because yeah i mean a lot of this stuff is is pretty much moot if it's successful in exactly one direction and exactly one interest universally so yeah exactly exactly justin you had your hand up and then i'll get to you nick uh, yeah, I guess I could just add, I think, Craig, you're spot on and talking about how open source is ubiquitous now. Um, and that's largely a uh, side effect of the technology uh, in terms of uh, worldwide networking, right? Because we have sites like GitHub, GitLab, open source is that much more accessible and it's everywhere. And yet one of the major tenants of open source um, one well, of the most important aspects is the educational aspect, right? Like this is this is why open source is important is because that's how people learn. And yeah, that's that's how people are getting into programming now is through these online communities, which is pretty awesome. But uh, yeah, it uh, it has this effect where it's like, okay, well, once once it's open and available, it's it's everywhere. Anybody can just copy paste do whatever they need to do um, and they don't need to contribute back, right? So it creates a big pile, a big body of work that's incredible, right? What the community offers right now is mind blowing, but it also just creates more and more 
uh, exploitable resource, right? And so then whoever, you know, has a good investment portfolio and says, oh, I want to make a business, they can just exploit all of that free labor that the community is trying to build for the community and, and the, you know, someone can get real rich real quick uh, without really providing much value other than, oh, you don't learn something. I'll just do it for you and you don't have to think about it. And so, yeah. I think that's, that's a very salient point. I want to get back to that um, in just a little bit. Nick, uh, you had a question or an answer, uh, comment. Well, a comment. Um, yeah, the, the genie is effectively out of the bottle with open source. Uh, there's no arguing that. And the there, there's two extremes. There's the good extreme that, you know, there are companies that want to uh, reinvest in the community that helped them to get the software that they use. And I've interviewed with a couple companies that are like that. On the other extreme, you have companies like, for example, Sony, who, you know, created a root kit that they put out on music CDs. And uh, they also got uh, sued because that had some GPL code in it that they didn't uh, share. But uh, no, it on on that extreme end with you know companies like sony uh that's unfortunately kind of something that you have to leave in the hands of uh lawyers and the court system because there's we're we're not lawyers here we don't know the legal system i mean i don't even pretend that i know it that well so it's kind of something that we just have to talk to another expert who's experienced in that wonderful use of twisting the English language. Yeah, exactly. I, I do feel like sometimes these discussions are a bunch of people that are feeling around the elephant trying to describe it without actually knowing what the elephant is. Um, but yeah, thank you. Dave, you have a comment. Yeah, it, it, been, it seems like uh, we're hearing uh, some amount of lamenting about uh, people who aren't using it as others intended it, and maybe the uh, progenitors of it would, would like it to be used. Yeah, it, it, I, I do get the sense, though, that for a huge portion of, of the computing that's going on today, uh, the open source products are, are the basis of them. If, if we were to go out and sample websites, how many of those are built with proprietary tools and how many of them are built with open source tools and how many of them are supported with proprietary <laughs> tools and how many of them are supported with Open source webs, uh, uh, you know, web servers and, and databases. I mean, Mongo and uh, MySQL and Postgres versus Oracle as a database. Uh, I, I think some of the biggest installations may stu still use Oracle, but I don't know. You know, that I, I get the sense that that the vast majority of um, websites out there are, are, are built in open source. Uh, the, the operating systems they run on, uh, that the servers run on, are, are open source. The browsers that we use with them, uh, Chrome, Firefox, uh, I don't know how, uh, how open uh, Microsoft's uh, and Apple's are, <clears throat> but that's a question too. Uh, my, my thinking is that while open source and Linux haven't taken over the desktop as we once thought they would, and, and there was a big fight over, uh, the desktop isn't the big issue anymore. No, it's sort of like nobody cares about that. Uh, the uh, Android is is a quasi open source system, uh, and and it's uh, a huge part of uh, the computing world today. As are the sites that uh, you tap into when you uh, when you use that phone. Uh, yeah, um, I can say as a web developer, um, I've worked with agencies and in a lot of different environments. Uh, almost all web development is. <laughs> vastly open source in terms of the technologies they use. Of course, distributing the, their applications is you know, depends on what's happening for that client or whatever. But yeah, no, the, the base of that technology is even on the corporate side, even if you look at Microsoft's technology, they have a huge open source stack for web development. That's pretty popular. Uh, it's not nearly as popular as the other open source systems such as PHP, Python, Perl, etc. But uh, 
yeah, yeah. The web is widely open source, and so are um, you know a lot of the related technologies. All right, and it also brings up another. You you bring up a, a really salient point, Dave, um, about the devices because we you know we talked about you know Linux on the desktop and whatnot. And it was always a big joke, you know, Linux on the desktop. Insert year here, but in some ways it we've we've moved past that and we've moved to the the smartphone environment which is way different and one of the things that came about is the epic versus apple lawsuit and app epic or um and google and all that other stuff where the actual concept of a general purpose computing device is now in question so when we talk about stuff like the iphone or android phones are they general purpose computing devices and is there the expectation on those devices for having them have open source software having them have be treated as a general purpose computing device like our desktops where you can load whatever software you want on them or does it have to be software that has to be blessed because it has to be um because the you know, the thing's got an FCC radio and app stores and all that other wonderful stuff. So that is that is one question that I do have on this is what is the, the role of open source on platforms that have not traditionally been considered a general purpose computing device or are they general purpose computing devices? Anyone want to take that that ball and run with it? <laughs> Go ahead, Nick. Um, yeah, you're, you're kind of <laughs> in a more traditional sense. Yes, they are a general purpose computing device. They access the internet. Uh, they access, you know, offline files, things like that. But yeah, uh, when you throw in the fact that they have um, radio frequency for accessing data and newer concepts like app stores yeah that does kind of muddy the water a little bit and moves it into a different area uh the 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 thing is though i mean coming back to the whole idea of getting open source uh to the general masses um it it takes somebody who wants to package it in the right way because <laughs> as much as we love using linux we can't hand it to somebody in the same way uh, that we love it and have them appreciate it. Uh, so things like Chromebooks, which are, for the most part, Linux on a desktop. Uh, it wasn't until Google put that out there. Um, with, with regards to what has to be open source and what doesn't, again, because cell phones are kind of this quasi new area and they are kind of a general purpose. No, they they don't have to have um, all open source on it. Uh, as you already explained, uh, Android is kind of an in-between proprietary and open source. So it's what you want. Uh, even uh, BlackBerry wasn't technically open source until um, it decided to give it up and become Android. Right. Yeah, it is. Um, it, it, Android, I think, is a very interesting case because it does start with an open core in a sense, and then has the the um, the Google applications that really make it all fit together. Um, and that is definitely not open source, as any Fdroid uh, person will probably tell you. Uh, Justin, you have a uh, your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, sorry. Uh, th I think it's a pretty interesting topic. Um, personally, like I want to support open source mobile platforms. I want to do that as much as I can. But I also think that as a consumer, I should be able to um, purchase a device that the creator can try to guarantee that no matter what I do on it, I can't install something that 
uh, affects the most secure part of my system, right? And what you do from there, how you expand that private key is depends on the platform. But like, I think there's a lot of value for the consumer to be like, hey, no, it's really important that there's, there is some core security that, yeah, that other applications can't reach because they're not allowed to write to that part of memory because we look at every single app or something like that. And it just seems like maybe that's a big part of that. Um, and I don't know if that can be done in an open source way. Uh, it seems like economically, at least there's big challenges to that. And what would that really mean? It's hard to say. Right. One thing, so I, I, I'm reminded of when Ma Bell uh, was broken up and you used to have to rent your equipment from Ma Bell. Um, and they made a big stink about, well, you don't want any old person hooking up any old equipment to the phone network because the phone network might get somehow disrupted if they do so. And that was proven to be not true. And so when, when people started hooking up their own phones and their own modems and all this other stuff to the network is when we started seeing some really interesting things happen. And I'm wondering if the, the reason when that we treat a cell phone in a different way is because it does hook up to a cellular network. And there's this mystique of we're going to do something horribly wrong if we allow people to do weird things to with a, um, a cellular radio that may cause the cellular network to throw a wobbler or whatnot. Harold, you had your hand up. Sorry, I got a, I got a hardware mute switch as well as the uh, software. No worries. <laughs> um, no, I was, I was going to snark and say, uh, do you have a landline? Uh, I don't know. I used to, and okay. it, but it was a cable modem landline. I don't, I don't know if it's uh, just us being lucky, but we get uh, at least a dozen calls a day from auto dialers and robo dialers and scammers who are very concerned that there has been suspicious activity detected on our account and would like us to give them their information. So I'm not sure if that's an argument one way or the other. Yeah, um, no, I, I understand. I understand. But the, uh, I guess one, one thing that is different is that with a wired service, the phone company can theoretically, you know, pull the plug on a an abusive uh, someone who's, who's abusing the line. Whereas with a radio, you know, you can you can swarm the airwaves or um, just generally ruin it for everybody. I think. Right, I think you could do that. I mean, if you if you were talented enough with the modern phone network, you could manage to do all sorts of things that could cause havoc with it. And I'm wondering if, I mean, if you knew enough about the cellular radios and whatnot, and and well, but I mean, they, they, they they physically they physically, they physically disconnect you from the network. Yeah, exactly. If it's a wire. If it's a wire, they can physically disconnect you. ATT can just come over and unplug you and say, "Nope." Yeah. Um, whereas with a cell radio, you know. Interesting. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that's a good argument. I'm just saying that is a difference. Right, Justin, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I think that is an uh, interesting, like, historical perspective. That's important, like, uh, Ma Bell's impact there. And, um, yeah, I guess that's probably still a concern for some people, but I also think that it's beyond that. I don't I don't care what network it's on. I, I think that it's important for that kind of device to be able to exist regardless. So that's it's kind of like... I mean, we're also kind of talking about like, well, why is it a problem? It's certainly not a problem if you make your own device that does exactly that. But if it becomes popular, then, well, now we have to talk about what that means because it's it's so big that it is a, an economic force. And, and that's, I don't know, it's interesting. And I think that it might be related to, you know, uh, common carrier or other like public utility aspects in our country. Like, um, how does that impact us? I don't know. All right. That's a good thought. Nick, you had your hand up. Um, well, it sounds too much like uh, they're trying to protect people from uh, themselves. And I was able to find this quote that I posted on Facebook recently. 
Uh, it's by Terry Lambert. It says, it's not Unix's job to stop you from shooting your foot. If you so choose to do so, then it's Unix's job to deliver Mr. Bullet to Mr. Foot in the most efficient way it knows. Right. Um, I remember that one. <laughs> it, it's just they... A lot of these companies uh, like to lock things down and uh, say, oh, it's for your benefit. Well, no, it's not. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, why are a lot of the cellular companies dropping things like 3G and moving strictly to 4 and 5G? Uh, it's because of money. Uh, again, why did Apple drop you know, support for the 32-bit uh, version of their iPhone and iPad? Uh, it's money. People can still use those devices. It's they there are ways around it, but it's kind of frustrating that they use the uh, mantra of "this is for your own good." It sounds very similar to what you guys are talking about with Ma Bell, even though I'm not old enough to really remember that. No worries. It, no, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Honestly, <laughs> Jim, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, uh... I got a couple of thoughts here. Uh, the 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 your your mention about Ma Bell and don't plug the phone in. You know, don't plug any old phone in because you might disrupt the network. What we have now is people out there purposely disrupting networks or disrupting the system. You know, whether uh, it, it doesn't even matter if we're talking cellular versus uh, hardwired. Um, uh, the computers now are so important to our everyday lives. They're, they're, you know, our cell phones are a, a terminal to the world, right? It's, it's a, it's a device that lets us do our banking. It lets us, um, communicate with each other. Um, it lets us do, uh, uh, you know, pay at the register with, uh, Apple Pay or Google Wallet or uh, I don't even know all the names. They're such an important device that we need. Um, I think there's a, a, a good argument for locking things down. Um, Apple, uh, you know, Apple locks things down. Certainly, Microsoft doesn't. Look at you know, uh, look at the Microsoft environment. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the operating system certainly isn't open source. You can't get in there and touch it. But anybody can write a write a program for Microsoft, and it can do almost anything, right? <laughs> uh, anybody can install any program that anybody wrote on the in the Microsoft environment, and you can you can twiddle anything you want at the hardware level. Uh, it's not locked down, and because of that, we've got ransomware attacks, and we've got you know the I, I don't know what percentage of the of the vulnerabilities out there are windows related but you know i get i get emails at least once a week uh was it the CISA emails or I'm, I'm on a couple of different lists and they're always talking about vulnerabilities in the microsoft operating systems um i'm not seeing those things for apple now you know people aren't running their business on apple but you know these phones half of the phones out there are running ios and people aren't having vulnerabilities in in the ios uh system like they are in in uh in in you know uh the microsoft world now uh, you know i'm comparing phones with desktops or, or even android um, um android's got some got some problems, right? I, I don't know much about the Android store and what it takes to write an app for Android and what it takes to get it installed, but I don't think it's anywhere near as rigorous as the as the as the Apple world. Uh, I, I've got some confidence. I, I kind of could detect Justin was was kind of uh, 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 following the same line of thought. I've got some confidence in my Apple phone that the thing is just going to work. Right, and, and you know, and I, I'm well aware that you know, um, uh, what's the quote? Was it Benjamin Franklin? Uh, uh, I can't even think of it right now. But uh, those who would yeah, give like, up uh, safety for um, uh, uh, liberty or uh, yeah. deserve yeah. either, and will lose both. Yeah, yeah, and I, I and that's that's you know, <laughs> I think about that. 
but I also like to have a secure system, a secure environment that I'm working with that I don't have to worry. If somebody has checked those applications that you get installed on my phone. You don't want, sorry? You don't want surprises. Right. I just want the damn thing to work day in and day out. And that's what it does. And yeah, I pay a premium for that. Yeah. But I, yeah. I, I can afford it. I, I appreciate the fact that I can pay that premium and get that level of security. And I know that, that you know, my mother-in-law, if she's got an Apple phone, I know I don't have to worry about her getting a virus on it, no matter how many stupid pinball games she installs. Yeah. Uh, the, right? There's, there's some value there. The, the, the platform that Microsoft created is a ghetto full of thugs oh, that are God. trying to frighten you into buying security. Literally. Yes. Yes. And, and that's that is terrifying. And I don't want my family to be in, involved with that. And honestly, right. one of the problems that Linux faces is that this all comes back to education because, yeah, well, all us tech nerds, oh, we don't have to be scared of the thugs because we are smart enough to know what's going on. Yeah. And like, and or, or you can use Linux and you can be smart enough to kind of push yourself out of that. But it's not because <laughs> Linux is just as vulnerable to viruses as Microsoft Windows is. It's lucky enough to have the open source community to, to try to make it better. But, uh, you know, we could if if Linux, Linux of the desktop 2021 happened, um, we'd have a lot of Linux viruses. That would be a big problem, probably. And we'd have a lot of old unpatched systems, I think. Yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah, that's huge, especially in the Linux world, because it's like, oh, you can run it on a toaster that's yeah. 10 years old. That's great. Yeah, and a router and a, yeah, everything. Harold, you have your hand up. And I also lost the plot because there are like several people that had their hands up. So I, I will try and get to you in the order in which I saw you, but I managed to lose the plot. <laughs> so yeah, I'll get to you as, as I can. There's so many discussions going on. There's so many points like, um, you know, the, 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 with regards to the shoot yourself on the foot quote, that's, that's all fair and well if you're using a, uh, a single user Unix system where, you know, you can destroy your own files and ha ha ha, you know, jokes on you. But if you're doing anything at all on the internet, you know, the vulnerability in your system now becomes a, a route by which a malicious actor can use as a jumping point to attack any number of people. So, it's no longer, you know, how, how many, I, I don't know this, how many distros allow you to run as root? I think a lot of them have disabled root, right? Yeah. Yeah, you don't, you don't have. Well, they're, disa they're disabled by default. Right. But, but that, is uh, a, that is an additional level of uh, security or, or prevent you from, from damaging yourself. Well, it's like running Windows as administrator, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the difference, though, is that Windows developers are so used to having full reign from, from uh, Windows 95, and a lot of the code base is carried over from programs written for Windows 95, yeah. that, uh, that the concept of, you know, running not as an administrator, a lot, some software just doesn't work on Windows. Right. Well, and, and Windows tends to value backward compatibility almost to a fault. Sure. In, in sure. a lot of ways, and, and in ways that's a strength, and in ways that is that is also why they carry around a lot of stuff that they can't manage to to yank. The legacy, out. yeah, that legacy stuff's a bitch. Yeah, either that or they just don't know how to code. Now, I don't. I, there's enough smart people over at Microsoft that I'm not going to throw them under the bus for not knowing how to code. Um, but I think it's it gets incredibly complicated when you're starting to support 20 plus years of of development and development mistakes and things that people are expecting to have happen that aren't necessarily going to happen. I mean, in looking at some of the things um, th that people have tried to do with modern systems and realizing that things break over time um, or that people start coding directly to the hardware and they start expecting things to be in certain areas that aren't in certain areas, it gets, it gets very challenging when you let other people into the playground. Charlie, you have your hand up and <laughs> I'm gonna surprise you. <laughs> you're still muted i'm afraid yeah thanks for that like i don't know somehow there's a feature where you can leave your hand up and i really wasn't trying to be like um that assertive 
Um, I right. do want to thank everybody for you know some really informed, salient, well stated um, views. Even some that I wasn't expecting. Um, right now, in my life, let's see. Can you see my desk? Um, we're mentioning something about an industry, which is kind of where I live. I'm taking my CPA exam right now. That is not a computer designation. That is certified public accountant. And the uh, one of the really important, the the starting point on the exam is understanding the profession, how it came to be, specifically the organizations, governing bodies, because you're one heartbeat from a lawyer in, in this field. And, um, you know, where, where, uh, where authority and argumentation come from all that. And there's, there's a strong recurrent thread of industry self-policing. And I think with the licensing discussion, um, people are expecting their impo the impossible. They're trying to come up with rules that will, you know, give Apple and Microsoft a conscience is really what it comes down to. And, um, I don't think you can have that. It it would be nice. It it'd be great. I'd I'd love to see that as much as anybody. But um, there um, yeah, there's there's just only so much you can get out of that. That's a really good point. That is a very valid point there. Because yeah, I think I think part of the reason that stuff like the Commons Clause came about was because people were trying to get Amazon to behave nicely, and not to you know basically take advantage of, of the, the gift that they have been given with open source software. And I don't even want to take away from the work that's been done and the effort. Um, you know, the, the licenses that we have are incredible. They're on the level of Roman law, you know, some of the stuff Stallman's put out and everything. And, um, and they're great. And my friend Gib will recognize this. My friend owns an electronic shop. He said that, you know, if it wasn't for the, the grassroots computer community doing what they can, you would have to pay Microsoft five dollars. No, I can say Apple. You'd have to pay every time you turned your computer on. I mean, Pretty it's much. impossible to say what effect we've had, but it's 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 been something. And I don't every want time to you look at a computer. <laughs> I mean, every time you look at a computer, he said. So yeah, that is that is an. an well, I'm wondering too if we're going to get back to that point because we we've mentioned that we have terminals basically to access the internet and to access computing ser uh, services that are out there. And so that is that is one thing, uh, thinking about the history of computing, where we started off with time sharing systems that were all centralized. We moved to personalized computers, and now we're starting to see that shift back over to, to using terminals again. And so that is that is something that I want to touch on. Um, Richard, though, you have your hand up. And I surprised you with that, I'm sure. Go ahead. I, yes, I think it's important to look at a little bit of the history of how software was created, distributed. Uh, when I started working in the mainframe computer business in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, um, they were sold by companies like IBM and you spent millions of dollars for the hardware and you got a free operating system, you got free COBOL compilers, you got free uh, assemblers, etc. cetera, uh, even free sorting programs. And uh, uh, but that didn't matter because they were making so much money off the hardware that they could afford to hire programmers to write the software and give it away for free. Um, uh, people wrote their own application programs and they weren't distributed uh, to any great degree. They were just for the, the needs of that particular company uh, or in my case, a bank. Um, and the, uh, there were companies who did write software and charge for it. Uh, a company like CompuWare that used to be downtown Detroit wrote uh, various pieces of software. One of them was called SyncSort, much more efficient than the free one you got from IBM, um, but it would sort data. Um, and then when the personal computer uh, world came out. Some companies made computers, but provided no software. 
And then other companies like Microsoft uh, jumped in the game really quickly and started pr producing a, a basic language. And they charged for it. Uh, so often, though, they would not charge the consumer. They would charge the company that was distributing the computers. So in, in essence, it was the same format as with the IBM mainframe. Uh, then uh, all of a sudden, Microsoft had a dilemma. And that dilemma was uh, they wanted to sell their basic to IBM. Uh, IBM couldn't get an operating system for their personal computer. So they all of a sudden, overnight, had to figure out how to develop and get a uh, operating system. They were able to get one from, from a company called Seattle Computers. Uh, and that got them started with DOS. But Microsoft did not make hardware. They only made software. And so they had to sell it to the computers manufacturers who would give it to the computer owners initially and then they sold it to the consumers uh, either either through the uh, computer manufacturers or directly. Uh, and then finally uh, open source came along. Uh, but the thing about open source is, is that it has to be done in a way where all the software developers are able to get earn an income and uh, put food on the table without having it come from the hour, hours they spend uh, working on the uh, open source software. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a valid, valid point. point. We, we, have, we have a bunch of, um, excuse me, I'm hearing myself. Uh, we have a whole bunch of, of folks that are, are trying to make livings we have a whole bunch of people that are writing software. And the thing is we've, we've incorporated this idea that if you write software, you will get paid for it at some point, either through your job or, you know, through some other means, whether it be, you know, community stuff or whatnot. And I think there's a lot of folks who are, are noticing that, they're, the software that they are writing is being used by a whole bunch of people and used by, you know, very large corporations and, and a lot of small corporations as well, then they're not seeing anything for their efforts. They're basically seeing other folks getting rich off of their hard work. And I know that that tends to upset a lot of folks. Um, I know that, you know, if I were doing something and Somebody managed to make a whole lot of money off of it, and I wasn't seeing any of it. Um, I'd probably say, "Hey, you know, could you share a little bit of the wealth or something like that? Send a little, send a few shekels over my way. That'd be nice. Uh, you know, cross my palm with silver, as Harlan Ellison used to say." So, yeah, that is um, that is definitely something that I don't know if it's necessarily been been. It has, I know it has not been addressed before, um, how folks, I mean, there was always the question of how do people make money with open source? And the answer is uh, documentation and support. Well, we're starting to find out that documentation and support is, here's our wiki and here is our Stack Overflow uh, thing where you can find all the support that you need because you know, actually contacting the company might not actually get you some support. Justin, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I thought you know, listening to Richard it made me think about the historical context of open source and how really uh, I feel like part of that is because we were all collectively learning um, computer engineering. And so uh, designing an algorithm and an assembly language uh, is much more like solving a, a mathematical problem, right? You're, you're trying to create a logical device. You're not, you're not really inventing something, you're discovering something. And so you solve a problem and you're like, oh, here, here's my quick sort implementation. And so, yeah, well, we upgraded to C and now you can change the names. Well, that doesn't mean anything. That's, that's silliness. So that's still essentially just 
a solved math problem. And so it seems natural to share this. And it makes me wonder where, where, where do we go wrong from there? <laughs> like where, do, where does, where does that get corrupted with business logic or, I mean, business logic is still just logic. It's very specific logic, of course, but if you take away the strings and the names, it is, you are discovering a system. You are like, you could say you're designing it, but well, you probably don't know exactly what system you want. And so you're like, oh, actually I do want a system that does this. And so you discover what changes need to be made to make that happen. And so, yeah, what, <laughs> what, what are we really licensing here? Uh, uh, you know, algorithms, that's, that's strange. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Harold, you have your hand up. Yeah, you were talking about, uh, you know, people putting this stuff out uh, as open source and then wanting money for it. Um, or saying, we're rather saying, oh, seeing other people get rich off of it. Um, I guess I'll be cynical. I don't know if cynical is quite the right word. And say, you know, that's something that you chose to do by making it available as open source. You know, you by, by making it available as open source, you open up the possibility that uh, whether you go GPL or, or you know, BSD, MIT, whatever, um, you open up the possibility that somebody else will come along and, uh, you know, make large amounts of money off of your work. You know, if you, uh, if you want to make money off your work, there are ways to do that. You know, you probably have to talk to a lawyer to write up a license. But, for example, um, talking about Epic and uh, the Unreal Engine, it works that way. You know, if you want to do uh, experimental stuff or stuff that you give away for free, I, th I think you can uh, give it away for free. Um, you can use the Unreal Engine. But if you make money off of it, you have to license it under a paid form, in which case, you know, you have to pay a certain chunk of your revenue to Unreal. Um, so I feel like maybe there's a con contradiction there between what, you, what people are doing and what they want. Uh, I don't know the right way to phrase that. No, I, I, I think I understand what you're saying. It's 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 sort of it's like the, the mousetrap versus the cheese type thing. You know, like once you get a, a certain a certain level, like I, I've seen this a lot with, with game engines, like you said, with Unreal Engine, um, Unity is also this way, where if you hit a certain revenue point, mm -hmm. you get a whole different license term right. uh, associated with that. And so that, that also brings up the point of, okay, so is open source in this context pretty much doomed? Are we looking at a scenario where if you want to use something for commercial purposes, well, here's, here's the, the terms that you have for that. I know one of the reasons that I use something like Godot is because I don't necessarily have to worry about revenue. I don't have to worry about commercial terms or stuff like that. I still have the ability to use it however I wish, no matter if I make one copy or a billion copies of it. Um, so that is one question that I have about this. Are we, are we looking at a future where commercial usage of open source is no longer uh, an option? Uh, because we have different terms for that. Richard, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, actually I did. I think it's sort of interesting to uh, uh, think about this in a very various ways. I think that uh, a couple of comments. Uh, Linux is based on Unix, which is really Bell Labs, but really large-scale computing operating system, very secure. Well, it's, it's IBM, a clean implementation of it, but yeah. Uh, IBM mainframe operating systems, very secure. Uh, also, uh, hardware features a, as well that uh, they, they work together. Uh, one example was uh, base plus displacement. Uh, no program is allowed to uh, address memory directly. The operating system assigns a base address and the program can only uh, manipulate the displacement. So 
In, in other words, to make a long story short, no program can attack another program because it doesn't know how to get to that other other address area. Um, only the operating system knows how to do that. Um, but right. the other thing is is that everybody has to prov provide for their own well-being. I remember I was at a PenguinCon uh, a good number of years ago, and there was uh, some open source software that uh, this one guy was working on. Well, he was a UPS driver. That was his day job, and his uh, this open source thing he was working on was his hobby, and that was absolutely fine. Um, but uh, at at a certain point in time, uh, there were companies, and their all their employees' day jobs were working on this software, um, and. Uh, uh, that was basically Microsoft, and there were also some other companies as well. And that uh, uh, that's the way it is. But open source, there are companies that have their day job or their main application, like 8x8. The company has 8x8, uh, but they, so they, they don't need to make money off Jitsi, which is open source. Right, which we're running right now, and and so if there, as long as you can have companies that can generate the software on the side, and individuals that can do it as a hobby, but it's it's a, not their their day job, uh, the open source can be successful. Now it so happens <clears throat> that because open source is based on this very solid foundation. Uh, it has taken over the server world. So one one question that I have on this is, we have so so it brings up the question of whether open source is just going to be one of these things that is a, as for passion projects, and whether it's something that people can actually use and do as a as a vocation are we going to relegate ourselves to people that have other sources of income that you know it we only have are are able to do be the the area for people to do you know their passion projects their little resume fodder and you know how how are we going to move from that dave you have a your head up and you have yourself muted as well off mute yeah, I had a couple thoughts on that, and and I think that there, what I'm hearing is a lot of angst here, a lot of uneasiness about people making money off of open source software, and and it was supposed to be free, and there may be therefore maybe nobody's ever supposed to make money on it, and and I, I'm not sure that not being able to make money doing what you're doing was ever one of the um, real objectives at the beginning of open source. Uh, there are two two different uh, perspectives on this. One is uh, is the quote from from Newton about if I see far, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And people saying uh, with open source software, I, and th this was brought to uh, out in a presentation I went to. Uh, I think I think Jim McClellan might have been there too. It was it might have been thirty years ago by Eric Raymond. Uh, and he asked everybody in the room there how many were considered themselves programmers, and, and about uh, you know about eighty percent of the room raised their hands. And he said, "Well, how many work for companies and work on projects that that is what you're making your your living doing?" And, and only about and only a few raised their hands. And his point was, "Well, why not just share all our software, and so that we can stand on each other's shoulders and, and learn and uh, and grow by seeing what every." Uh, everything else everybody else is doing i think that that was the um uh and, and i and things that i've heard stallman say are, are along that lines too the original objectives of this were to be able to see and understand what is going on how things are done how pe other people have solved problems they weren't to ensure that nobody ever made money on it and one of the mechanisms that was put in there to to make sure that everybody uh, can continue learning from it is you got to keep sharing the software and if you 
you you know you distribute it you got to distribute your software upgrades as well so trying to mix in this angst about somebody else making a lot of money on what i did which i understand i mean nobody else likes to see somebody else get rich off of something you contributed to but i'm not sure that was ever a part of the original uh, thought of, of open source and i want to add one more thing here is my perspective on this is that it has been wildly successful Open source is now permeates everything, even though profit motive comes in there all over the place too, but that's good. Open source has enabled people all over the world to write programs and see how other people have written programs and develop programs. As, as we saw just a little while ago, almost everything developed on the web is done in open source tools. There's barely a, a closed source programming language out there anymore. Right. No, the reason I, I bring up the uh, the economic thing is that I have seen discussions where people have said that the open source has completely been blindsided by economic factors and people basically exploiting the labor of others. And so that's where that's where all of that has been coming from. And that's part of the reason that I keep bringing it up is to try and keep those voices at least heard in some of these discussions because that is one important thing i think for open the future of open source is that if we just become the the labor pool for a whole bunch of companies to go and and dip into whenever they need something and it's like thank you so much see you later um that that is a worrying trend that i have seen in a lot of this stuff carlos you have your hand up Your computer's muted for some reason. Charles. You're still, you're still muted. There. Not working? Okay. Sorry. Uh, Justin, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you were talking earlier kind of like the way that made me think that, yeah, like what if you could, you could be a, just a programmer and write open source software and make a living like – can you do that without the context of working for a major corporation or something like that? Um, and I don't know, in, in America, yeah, you start an LLC and write some open source software and uh, yeah, ask for money. There's like systems like Tidelift is uh, something I've heard of and you know, uh, just like tipping systems that as you know, people accept money at or use Patreon, something like that. But uh, that seems pretty difficult still. And yeah, when you do that, even if you are getting paid, everything you make is, well, uh, instantly, trivially reproducible. And so someone could just be, someone could just, oh, well, we'll just copy your value and uh, redistribute it at a different cost or something like that. And so that, that, that's how that affects the competition there. And you know, we don't really know what would happen, I guess. Right. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, yes. Go ahead. Um, I, my, my knowledge is slightly limited in this, so feel free to correct me or feel free to you know enlighten me in some respects. But uh, I don't think we had necessarily talked about the Linux kernel at all. That's a very successful open source project that uh, major corporations invest time and money into. There's, uh, from my understanding, there's people that work full time jobs developing for the kernel for the hardware and everything. Like that. Right. Um, that that's I, I feel like that's the other side of this coin here, where you can get some sort of uh, you know gratification for your work. You can be it can be verified that open source is uh, very strong and very uh, well uh, for corporations. Um, I had a I had a question there too. I don't know if um, if it's necessarily yeah. possible, but is it time for open source to evolve a little bit or something? Is there is there an ability for open source to change to some effect to adapt to today's times, you know? Um, well, and that's what people are, are asking about. And I think that was part of the discussion that we're having here is what what exactly would an evolution look like? Um, you, you brought up the point too about uh, the Linux kernel and that. So 
it seems like a lot of Linux kernel development is for the people who have the ability to, um, I don't know where that sound is coming from, who have the ability to work for a company or at least put in a lot of time and effort and have another company pay for that uh, time and effort and have those ch those patches and changes and whatnot uh, brought into the kernel. So, you know, is 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 that a is that an arena where it's going to wind up where only companies that can afford to have the the folks be able to have a say in the kernel? Um, that's a that's a question that I have. Harold, you had your hand up and you're ready to go. Um. So yeah, I'm wondering if anybody who's worked in a corporate position has ever managed to go to management and say, "Well, we don't legally have to pay money to use this software, but it would be nice. You know, it would be it'd be morally." Uh, <laughs> I've done it. I mean, and and okay, I, part part of it is yes, there are there are the certain ones where it's like if we want to have support, if we want to have a new version. Of whatever it is then yes we have to send our money over to it oh yeah but that, that, that in that case you're getting something in return i'm talking yeah. about like like uh i missed the name was it justin was was i saying you know if uh some small developer produces some open source software that's useful yeah and management has the option of paying for it or not paying for it now, if they want to pay for additional features or whatever then then you know it's a benefit on both ends and they might do it but um but that that is that is one question, and, and I don't want to shame anyone. I don't want to uh, get into a discussion about particular uh, licenses and licensing terms. But how many people have paid for Vim, or at least send in their little donation for Vim that it asks you at the very beginning uh, to donate to? Um, I think it's Ugandan uh, children and such. Well, because I was I was looking at some of the uh, just a few of the the things, and uh, let's see, canonical is owned is a private company owned by uh, the guy who got rich off of verisign um geez, so was it red hat red hat sold to ibm where they make money by doing surveys and support right right um exactly. i'm i'm not sure that there's a lot of open source companies that sell or that that, that or th i feel like th th this has become more and more of a patronage type thing you know the company will sponsor improvements and additions to the linux kernel because they you know ibm wants to sell power processors and so they spend money on support for power processors within the kernel um and maybe there might be some big companies that that will sponsor a few developers uh for the purpose of you know charity or write-offs or whatever but um i'm looking at projects like docker which is uh, become really really big in the you know the web apps uh container solutions department and the docker company is making like none money i, I think they're uh, i think they're financially at risk because of it right and you also bring up a, a very valid point and a point that i wanted to get to which is about mega mergers that we've been seeing and in open source software as well but before i do that uh gib you have your hand up Yes, thank you. So um, this concept of paying for open source, very interesting topic. I mean, I'll make it really simple and say big companies have to have contracts with organizations. And sometimes it's been very difficult for an open source company to comprehend the idea of why would they spend time actually working with a big company to get a contract in place when it's, it's free. Um, and I ran into that. I could not get the, an open source company that you know provided software that was really helpful to us to go through the this long, difficult process to get registered as uh, a vendor so that we could send them money. Um, I think well, also that, that's also with Ford, though. You have to do all the PO stuff, right? Absolutely. And just a yeah. crazy amount of effort to do that and just, you know, all kinds of hurdles and stuff like that. The other part is that there are, open source companies or organizations or, or you know open source groups that make it real difficult to work with them because they have this you know nonchalant everything's free kind of opinion so like there's one company that we wanted to use their software but they said in their licensing agreement that you have to buy them a beer 
and Ford didn't, I don't know why, I don't know why Ford can't buy someone a beer, but Ford balked at that and would not buy them a beer. Um, and then there's also this certain um, computer club that I keep telling them if they just put their payment methods into an event rather than a membership, I might be able to send them money, but they just refuse to do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll get a PO all set up for you. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And that's, that is one of the difficulties too, um, is if you have someone who is doing this as a, you know, not their primary job, it's not part of their business or something like that, or even if it is their business, if they have to go through a whole bunch of hoops and pay really expensive people, really expensive money in order to get a really expensive way to get, you know, something set up so that they can accept, you know, $150 or something like that, that can get a little, that can get a little much. I don't know. Charlie, you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just want to make a short note here on um, the mercantile nature of software. Um, this is a big area because we solve significant problems. I had a company that had a six month uh, project for uh, you know their accounting as it was in place. And I was able to use some Python libraries and complete the project in about five milliseconds. Um, the program was three lines long. Any of you guys could have piped it down to one line, probably. And um, uh, just just last week, I offered. There was a similar situation with the client at work. I told my boss, "Hey, if you get, if he'd done it kind of by hand, he's more efficient." But um, I said, you know, if, if you get something like this in the future with more magnitude, um, I have a piece of software I developed. You know, we can do all of it instantly. And um, there's when I told any of my friends about this, all they could think was, oh, why don't you make money off that? And uh, it's, it's 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 the big divorce between the haves and haves nots of uh, of. More traditional computing. Um, just wanted to mention that there, there's always there's always going to be a, a variety of implementations you can do because because you can solve really big problems. Yeah, oh, you sound like my mother. There, the how are you going? You know, you could make money off of that particular thing, and it's like, yes, I could form an LLC and I could do all of this stuff to try and make this thing into a business, or I could just put it up on the internet and people could use it, and then I could see the twenty people that actually wanted to download this that had a slight interest in whatever it was that I, up, I uploaded. Yeah, and related to that, related to Ford, I'm looking at the uh, SQLite here. I can't find the exact wording, but um, one of the concerns as a, as a small or independent software provider, it would be that the company that wants to license or wants to pay you may oh. want additional rights or requirements on top of that. Um, they want to make sure that you know, basically what they want liability. They want to say, okay, you, you certify that you have the uh, ability to sell this software that you defend it against copyright infringement and, you know, all this stuff. And it's like, well, okay, you want to send me $150, but I got to take this license and hand it over to a lawyer to make sure that I'm not exposing myself to, I don't know how much liability. That's not worth it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you mentioned before, um, about various companies that are be, seem to be in an acquisition mode. So Red Hat recently got purchased by IBM, Microsoft purchased GitHub. Um, there, a lot of companies seem to be acquiring and aqua hiring a lot of open source projects out there. Is that necessarily, is that a disturbing trend? Is that something that folks are like, yeah, you know, any, any, any port in the storm, it's going to make things stronger. Is it going to make things weaker? Are we going to start stratifying a lot of this stuff? Um, any thoughts on that? Wow. I expected a little more than that. <laughs> Go ahead, Mark. Um, just to kind of maybe go back for a minute, 
you, you know, if, if you want to make money on on software, I, I don't think you should be releasing it as open source because the the moment one other person improves your program, it's it's not yours. It, it's a gift. You got you got to give it away, expecting to get something back. It, it, that's not, that, not the right mentality. Um, the the other comment I've been wanting to make is uh, Microsoft's new CEO gets it. I, I mean, I, I used to just can't stand Microsoft, but I swear that new CEO, when he did that uh, Microsoft Heart Linux thing, totally changed my attitude. My, Microsoft, you got to give them a lot of credit for the effort. They, they know they got to. They, you have to embrace open source in this They're day and age. They're definitely playing a different game. Um, cynical me thinks that uh, and this is a complete aside that they're turning LinkedIn and GitHub into the way that people get hired nowadays. So LinkedIn is where you put out your resume and get contacts with all of your various uh, recruiters and GitHub is where you put your programming profile. And that is your, your portfolio of, of code mm -hmm. and whatnot that you send out. That is something that I've said numerous times. And I think that that is part of their strategy overall is to turn open source into that thing that you do in order to get that job you want to get hired to use the real the uh microsoft products in whatever environment that you're using that is my cynical view on this um, i can tell you the day that ibm bought out red hat i sold all my red hat stock oh. and the, and when microsoft uh did the iheart I bought Microsoft stock, and I'm telling you, those are just devastatingly good moves. So, uh, I my Microsoft stock sucked today. I'll give you that. But, uh, <laughs> I think all the tech stocks sucked today. I'm afraid. Jim, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna. You were talking about these uh, mergers and buyouts. You know, in the case of Red Hat, they went public like in what 2003. So it wasn't like they went from this uh, little mom and pop startup uh, to get uh, acquired by IBM. I think if you go back on the mailing list uh, years and years back, you'll see me talking about buying Red Hat back in those yeah. days. Um, but, you know, as for some of the others, you know, you, uh, I, I ran a somewhat uh, successful open source project for about 10 years. And you, you do that and, you know, people use the software, they contribute it and stuff, but it gets tiring, you know, and, and a lot of these guys, the, the MySQL guys, you know, they sold to Sun, God, what, they get a billion dollars or something ridiculous like that. A at some point, it, if you can't make your money in services, you know, because that's the, that's the promise of open source, you know, give the software away for free and make your money in services. The MySQL guys, you know, they just, they had to sell it and, and uh, that's how they got their money. You know, it's, for me, it was like I got kids going to college soon. I gotta, I gotta, you know, I can't keep giving my software away for free and expect to be able to pay for a couple of three college educations. Um, and this, that's what you know, the MySQL, uh, when Oracle uh, came out, they, they went back into the breach, once back into the breach and then, uh, created Maria off of that. So. Well, yeah, because they already had their money. You know, yeah. <laughs> you can create a lot of Marias when you when you got a billion dollars in your bank account. Um, but, you know, some people know how to monetize the open source world. And some people, you know, in, in terms of selling services. And some people, they just finally kind of give in and they, they sell their project. Um, you know, to to the highest bidder, to Microsoft or to IBM or to Oracle or to whoever, because uh, at some point people got to make money, and right. you know, can't always do it with services. So, is that the future? Then is it just going to be held by a few fiefdoms? Um, well, there's always. I, I think there's always going to be innovation. There's always going to be new things. You know the 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 Redis and the Node and and those guys developing those languages and you know and, and eventually it leads to selling to a company and I, I think that's kind of the pattern we're going to see over and over and over somebody comes up with a new idea they 
they put it out there as an open source project that lasts for a little while and then they they cash in. Hmm. Gib, you have your hand up. Yeah, well, there's just so much rich content to what we're talking about here. So um, I just, you know, this IBM Red Hat, you know, Red Hat saying their software is open source, but you can't seem to get services from them without, you know, some finagling and stuff like that. Microsoft and GitHub, it's like Microsoft, uh, even though they have a history of some really bad behavior and stuff, maybe uh, they are lifting themselves up and making this, uh, you know, a, a more pleasant world and all that. Uh, and also add in VMware and Dell, and I don't know how that, you know, coordinated thing is, but uh, so they're all, I think, looking to find some niche way to then leverage something smaller to make something really big out of it. Um, and this is, you know, a constant kind of thing to to see with open source products uh, that, you know, it becomes popular enough, now you buy into it or own it, and then you could leverage that to make your thing, whatever it is, uh, more popular. Um, so there's a, also a, a story just came out that GM has uh, partnered with this uh, uh, Nikola, um, you know, it's a, it's a truck maker that they're going to make these wide, uh, long range trucks that uh, use uh, um, some other propulsion f format. And um, this is all uh, so the opposite kind of way where uh, you're going to you know, pick up a small company that is has the potential for being something really, really big. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking something along the lines might happen with the open source stuff that the Microsoft, we think of them as a real big company and all that. But, you know, they think about the, the number of products and things that they put out that are really ubiquitous. And it's it's basically the the desktop software. They really haven't. I mean, in some cases, they have picked up a lot more. But the, the key point is that they're trying to leverage this open source software to um, open up other markets because they're stuck. They can't sell to any more of something they dominate. If you own the uh, whole industry, you can't expand with that industry. You have to expand out to something else. So it's going to be interesting to see as uh, open source companies are acquired by companies that don't really have a relationship with the proprietary part of that. Well, and, and Microsoft is a unique case too because they've they they managed to do a pivot, I think, into cloud computing, and I'm not sure if you say it's a successful pivot, but it is it is a credible pivot. I mean, more credible than I think some other organizations have been able to manage into cloud computing, um, which then brings up the other question. So what is, I mean, we, we think of open source software and cloud computing as being, you know, like an Apache server, or a uh, Nginx server, or Docker, uh, various other languages and whatnot. Is that going to be the future? I mean, are we going to have, um, is, are we going to be at some point bringing up our browsers and accessing our desktop computing in the cloud? Uh, I saw one article that, or at least a headline passed by that says, the future of the desktop is in the cloud. Is that somewhere where we're going to be headed? Anyone want to jump on that? So let me <laughs> let me play back a little bit. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think the idea, I'm, for a long while ago, I remember I was at PenguinCon and I mentioned to someone, all I need is a browser and I can get to whatever I need. Um, and they were kind of, you know, oh yeah, I guess that's the, you know where it's going. Uh, I'm struggling at work with trying to get people to use my cloud service. So I have this environment that people can, you know, spin up a virtual machine or a container or whatever. And a lot of the mindset of the developers is my laptop. They own a laptop. They can control it. They have full, you know, access to whatever they need. They can, you know, configure it however they want. They have not, I guess, relinquished the control in order to have the flexibility of the cloud. So I think we got a long ways to go yet. Well, in, in a lot of ways, when I think of a cloud computing, I don't necessarily think of control, or at least I don't think of myself as being the one that is in control of that. It's whomever managed to make the image, whomever managed to preload it. If it was myself, then cool. But I'm not necessarily in full contact 
in full control of whatever it is that I'm looking at. So as, as, as one of those developers who would balk at this stuff, I mean, maybe I'm a dinosaur. Maybe I'm, I'm going to be the person that's going to be thrown out to pasture at, at some point, and someone's going to look over my shoulder and go, that's nice, Grandpa. You're using Vim. I'm using, you know, whatever in the cloud. Uh, see you later. Um, maybe that's the way that things are going to go. Anyone want to jump on that? Go ahead, Gemini. So there are actually companies right now that have taken advantage of desktop as a service. Amazon has its own desktop as a service, um, the AWS product. And it's been, it went really big, especially during these times when um, the COVID and they had to provision desktops or remote desktops for uh, people that are now mostly working remotely from home. And, and what it provides these companies is more secured um, environment. Uh, so, so the remote workers can use their own desktops to connect to the remote desktop and do work related stuff in the remote desktop. And, right. and that's, that's a big thing. Yeah, I know um, in certain educational environments, they have, you know, you actually have your desktop PC, and then you had the ability to remote into that particular PC. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating to see all that stuff. Um, especially it's fascinating to see people trying to use their home network, which is slow to try and access their remote machine, which is also not terribly fast to try and do video processing. Uh, that can be real entertaining. Harold, you have your hand up. Oh, Carlos. Yeah. Here. I feel like, yes, I could. So I work on um, embedded-ish Linux, you know, Linux running on a box that you put somewhere. Um, and so, yes, I mean, in theory, we could do all this work through, uh, you know, I could, I could run my compilers and my tool chains and whatever on a server. It's all command line stuff. Yes, that's, in that's entirely possible. Um, I'm not sure about the flexibility of you know just spin up an image whenever because um our tool image is like around one gig and and growing um but whenever i do stuff on the server it just kind of feels like uh one of those like plastic boxes that they have for for working with uh you know viruses or bacteria or whatever i feel like i've got my hand through gloves trying to do stuff because my the software on my desktop is so much more powerful than uh, the stuff I can use remotely. Yeah. And maybe I, that'll, you know, Sun was trying the, the network uh, client, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, the so, Java stations and the yep. Sun. Um, what the hell was that? I have one downstairs. Sunblade. Sunblade, yeah. yes. And on a, on a LAN, you might be able to pull that off. Um, but, you know, my I have Comcast. My connectivity is not certain. <laughs> so if I have my tools on my laptop here and the internet goes out, I can still do stuff. If I'm working purely on a server. Yeah, exactly. Carlos, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'll offer uh, two points of view here, one from like a corporate side and then one from like a personal side here. Um, my company started using Citrix more. They started using the virtual terminals and everything like that. It'd be nice if the hardware was there, maybe the hardware is there, maybe they don't have it all the way set up or something like that, or maybe it's the networks, but you get this little delay on things. You get all this frustration associated with it too. And if you got a call center environment, you can't even move over to that technology for people that are at home because you, you got you got them dropping off all the time and everything like that. You, you get constant issues with this stuff. And one of the biggest things they always wanna do is replace the hardware. And it's like after a while, it's not the hardware anymore. It becomes the system that's the issue. And I, I don't feel we're necessarily there yet, but it, it definitely, you get that feeling like it's going to happen eventually. You just got to wait for technology to evolve or maybe the networks to evolve. Um, that's the feeling I get like from my point of view at my, my company. But uh, the personal thing, too, I'll bring up uh, Google Stadia. This was going to be the big thing. Everyone was going to play games in the in the cloud and everything like that. 
and you don't hear anything about Google Stadia anymore. I don't even think you get any advertisements for it. The, the people that invested into it d didn't even get the quality of service that they wanted. Um, I, I know that's partly because of the network, but at the same time, it's like, I don't know. It, it feels um, like you're reaching for the ether, trying to expect something more out of something that won't happen. It, it almost feels like it won't happen, but it feels like they're trying to make it happen. Well, I, I think this is one thing that this whole um, pandemic has really brought to the forefront is that the U.S. broadband is not great. And so when people are like, oh, yeah, we can do uh, Google Stadia or any of these other things, it's like, yeah, good luck with that. You know, you get someone that's out there with, you know, paying a, a premium for 50 down and five up trying to do real time video and stuff. It's like or even, you know, the folks that are out in, in remote areas that are getting 10 down and being told to be grateful for that. And that's just that's just not not a good look. U.S. Uh, broadband providers. Charlie, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, the last uh, um, fellow, the, the one with the cool looking room, you know, mentioned something that, yeah, I think gets to the essence of uh, there's a lot of charm for new platforms and kind of maybe what Microsoft was kind of going for when they, you know, with, with their last CEO. Um, there seems to be the promise of, uh, it's almost like just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, there's a lot of excitement about, say, moving this stuff to online. And I'm going to use the example of uh, bookkeeping software with clients. I have um, I have offered my coworkers. No, I've offered my own clients too. They subscribe to QuickBooks Online, and I want to get them off it. I say cancel your QuickBooks Online. I'll do it for free because it will take. I'll, I'll you know come in on Saturday, do your write up for free. And it will save me less time, you know, having to untangle their mess and their unwieldy slow platform. And it doesn't have to be that way. It's because the platform is unwieldy and slow. Um, most accounting software, as we know it today, you know, that there are sizable organizations that have real uses and whatever. But for the most part, accounting software is a glorified column summing database. And on that level, my daily use 2004 laptop, you know, is not inferior to... You know, they're just trying to solve the wrong problem. It's like you always hear about uh, switching hard drives for solid state drives to get Windows 10 runnable. You're solving the wrong problem there. Um, you know, there's all this enchantment for new technologies, but uh, uh, it's almost like web development. I know I'm covering a lot of broad areas here, but you know, what what is it in HTML5 that you know we couldn't do with standard HTML? Uh, what is it? with all the feverish open source development, I don't want to take away from some legitimate contributions, but for the most part, you know, I, I think computers are doing the same things they were doing 20 and 30 years ago with a few narrow exceptions. You know, you guys are a bit more high engagement on this stuff, but um, you know, for the most part, there's, there's all this glitz of new technology and it doesn't seem to be solving the root problems any better. I'm only going to cover one more area. The new landlord here, well, my new landlord, is uh, he's a teacher in the Detroit school system. And they started school yesterday, I think. Um, they distributed Chromebooks and tablets to all students for, you know, moving school entirely online. And, you know, Bill Gates is just, you know, slobbering at the thought that, you know, education is moving online. And he'd spend as much as an hour for an individual student just trying to get them to log into their platform. Um, it doesn't seem to be the fault of the software. It's just not a better solution at this point. I don't know that it ever will be in a lot of cases. It's definitely gotten a lot more complicated. Um, that's for darn sure. Um, and and it, for HTML5, I will, I will say one thing, that HTML5 does so much better than the rest of it. The canvas is amazing. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. It's so amazing compared to what was out there. Anyways, Justin, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, um, I guess there are a couple of things there, but, uh, yeah, the, um, I don't know, uh, the educational thing made me think about how often people look at technological solutions, like they're silver bullets. And I feel like I'm constantly trying to work with clients in a way where I'm like, you know, not that I'm trying to tell you not to 
have me do something for you, but I want you to think about it in a, a, a better perspective and think about what you actually want done and what, what solution fits really? Like, are you just creating different kinds of problems, pushing it down the road or something like that? Um, but yeah. And so, yeah, clearly here we have educational systems. They're like, Oh, well, uh, we only know the obvious here is like, Oh yeah, you could meet online, I guess. And that will solve all our problems. But really maybe we just need to like invest in our educational system more. <laughs> um, well, in a lot of ways, it's like telling people that you can uh, get around without a car, you can use a bike and not solving the problem of actually having bikes on the roads and sharing them with cars. Not to put too fine a point on it, but yeah, it's it's yeah. like we, we tell people this is the way to go. And it's like, yes, but the infrastructure isn't there or you yeah. haven't taught me how to do this stuff. Yeah. Or which you're is, expecting me to know how to ride a bike. Yeah. And maybe I've been taught. <laughs> yeah. And you mentioned the telecoms earlier, and that's like one of my pet peeves is like these telecoms are abusing us so badly. It's ridiculous. And yeah. yeah, it's holding us back. I want I want to try subscription gaming services. That sounds so much fun to be able to like, you know, like have a good month and celebrate by like, you know, just streaming whatever you want and like that sounds like a great consumer experience. Um, and a lot of these cloud services are really good for that. But then we have these telecoms that like, you know, that requires their participation, which is to say uh, the participation that we are publicly funding and they are just, you know, that money is just going into pockets and it's, we seem to have this fear of trying to readdress this problem because that is admitting that we didn't address the problem, but like, <laughs> yeah, no, we didn't address the problem. And yeah. now we need to address the problem. Like this is not working. Uh, we're really pretty much back where we were to begin with. And like, yeah, we just need to like really take care of that. Exactly. Gib, you have your hand up. Yeah. So I think there's something really interesting that we're going to see coming out of COVID uh, so we're, you know, concerned about network performance. And I know I have one place where I'm like really connected and it's really great. I know another place where I keep getting dropped and that type of thing. So the experience is very different for me based on something that I don't have any control over, but that I can begin to understand. And so, you know, this whole thing about whether you want to have something on a laptop or a central server, this all becomes questions that I think the young folks that are using school resources and stuff are going to have to start questioning and understanding. We're going to get to the point where the kids coming out of elementary school, out of high school and stuff, are going to have a much better understanding of how to configure and put together a solution that gives them the, that good feeling and response and all that. I'm just wondering at what point the high school kids are going to be designing the solution for the school using open source. And I, you know, I'm really hoping that the schools sort of encourage that along the way. Right. No, definitely. I mean, you know, the future is for the young, honestly. Um, so it will be, in, I'm, I'm hoping that we can, at least give them a better future um, than, than what we came into. Um, I mean, I, I think about the days when we had stuff like CPM and, and, and DOS and whatnot, and some of that stuff was not that great. Um, the fact that I, I graduated into a world that has had a Linux kernel and that I could install stuff on my computer, um, that, is a, that is a precious gift. And that is something that I want to be able to share uh, with future generations and have them be able to have an experience where they are able to do what they need to and want to do with their computing, as opposed to having it be dictated by another entity out there that has, doesn't necessarily have their best interests at heart. Uh, final thoughts, anyone, does anyone have any final, go ahead, Harold. Yeah, it kind of, kind of bring it back to the uh, discussion of the future of open source. Um, you know, yeah, your web server is open source and the underlying layers of your operating system might be open source, your browser might be open source, but what do you get with it when you actually put those pieces together? Um, you know, most of the stuff we do on the web, most of the quote unquote web applications are proprietary. They're designed to, you know, pull your information 
whether whether it's malicious or, or not, they're, they're designed to pull your information into a proprietary system, either to lock you into that system or uh, you know to monetize you one way or another. You know, yes, you can set up your own um, office cloud thing, but it's so much easier to just sign up for a Google account and use Google Docs. You know, yeah, you're giving your information to Google, but it is just so much easier to do that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Dave, you have a comment. Yeah, I, I think Harold's comment there was was spot on about the uh, uh, the web app thing, the, the, the whole open source um, world was created uh, in an environment where you had to have your own computer or, or a computer that you had access to in order to, to run the software and in order to give people access to software you were giving them software to run on their computer now that we have uh, a, a fairly uh, prominent if not dominant mode of computing being uh, web apps the, you're never distributing the software anyhow all you're, do, you're distributing is the running of the software and and so it doesn't really fit that that kind of computing uh, doesn't really fit the the model of uh, you know the mechanisms of, of open source and and there's certainly something to be looked at there. I know I, I've heard a lot of uh, finding about how that's working out or not working out for open source. And there's a problem. Well, and some of that is is things like the the AGPL, uh, where you are even if you run the software on a web server, you are still compelled and asked to re, um, produce the soft the uh, the source code that you're using if you change it. Um, so that there's a lot of applications that are using the AGPL in right. that way. But, um, but that's, an, that's an extension. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's the, the license in order to accommodate that. And yeah. it was licensed before, uh, you know, may not apply and, and, and. Um, so, you know, there, things are always changing. There's always a new world coming. I think that open source has been wildly successful. And that uh, if we do a full uh, counting, uh, if we if we add up all the places where we're using it uh, and where it dominates, uh, it, it's it's been had a massive impact on the computing world. I, I don't yeah, think definitely. That. Well, that seems as good a place as any to uh, wrap this up. I want to thank everyone for such an amazing conversation. This has been. Uh, beyond my expectations, I was I was expecting to drive a lot of this stuff, so I am massively grateful that I did not have to do that. Um, so I want to thank everyone for coming out. By all means, uh, if you would, speaking of places on the internet where uh, it is not necessarily open source, please fill out our comment card, which is on the Google forums, uh, and let us know how we did for today. Uh, we have... Coming up next month, uh, Scott Valnaves is going to be talking about open VPN and VPNs in general, which is going to be fasc a fascinating topic because we are living in a VPN world. We are living in a world where connectivity to remote offices and remote servers needs to be secured and needs to have different requirements than just popping off over to, via an SSH tunnel to whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, so this will be a, a fascinating topic. And I, I, I mean, I, either you're using a VPN or you should be using a VPN at this point if you're connecting to any kind of remote computing. So definitely check us out next month, uh, November. as well. And basically for the foreseeable future, we are going to be online. So if you know someone that would like to come to our meetings, uh, or if you yourself are traveling, happen to be traveling, we're going to be online, so you're not going to be missing anything. So please keep coming to these meetings, and we look forward to seeing you in the months ahead. Thank you. Great job of mediating, Craig. Thank you. Yeah, Craig. Fantastic. Thank you. So fill out your forms and submit them, please. Right. Going to turn the streaming off. So, thank you everyone who's been on streaming. We'll catch you later. See you. But we're going to do an afterglow as well. So, if you all want to stay.